So I've been asked to walk the talk ever since I was a little baby, but now that I'm in a wheelchair, that's not possible. But if you stay tuned, you will hear from a guest who's going to help us talk the walk. Disability Life TV is sponsored by Connor Dental Associates. Hi, my name is Yvette Pegues and I am your host today for Disability Life TV. Thank you so much for watching. We have a virtual guest today, so don't be alarmed. I know I'm sitting here by myself, but Mr. Rich Luby from Talk the Walk Disability and Inclusion Consulting is actually on the phone and he's going to explain to you exactly what he does and why you should tune in. Hey, Rich, are you there? Yes, I am. Excellent. Thank you for virtually joining us today. Tell us a little bit about who you are. I know that you're in the northeast part of the country, but I'd like to get to know you as our guests are getting to know you as well. So tell me a little bit about Little Rich and some of the things about your childhood that we'd love to learn more about. Absolutely. First off, thank you very much for you and your team for having me on and have this opportunity to speak to you. Um, a quick introduction. I love how you said little rich. So back in the day, I got to revert <laughs> back to a little kid. There you go. <laughs> yeah, so um, I, have a, I have a personal connection to the disability community and, and also a professional connection. My personal connection is I, I was born with the ability of cerebral palsy uh, at a young age. Um, so growing up with cerebral palsy, you know, going through reconstructive surgeries, physical therapy, things of that nature, um, it really helped hone and build the man I am today. I, I don't know if you noticed I said born with the ability of. Because I, I think, noticed that. Yeah, I think that when individuals are, are born with a disability, we have to sometimes overcome certain barriers, and it helps us develop into a better person. Uh, and, and, and a lot of times, individual society, a disability is framed as something negative, and I, I'm looking to showcase the positives, the abilities beyond a disability. And I love that about you because... Our show is spelled with a capital A for that reason, but what you do as a professional, and we'll get to that, does a couple of things. As much as I like to enforce our abilities to be seen from a position of ability, what protects us as people who identify with a specific disability is the word disability. So while I understand in certain contexts, especially when you're raising a young child, it's important to enforce abilities, but also in cases where you're fighting for the ADA and the protection of the government, the word disability is what they understand. So what you do is so important to me, and, it, and I find it so amazing that you speak of cerebral palsy very differently than I've had other guests on the show. So if you don't mind taking a few minutes to tell me about this reconstructive surgery and how it is that you are physically different than a, a large population of people who identify with the very same condition. Absolutely. Uh, great question. You know, as you know, individuals with cerebral palsy, there are different severities and different cases. Uh, for my specific case, it affected my motor skills, okay. um, my balance, and specifically more the right side of my body. Um, so with, when, with mobility and walking, I have a noticeable limp or within my gait. Okay. Um, and these reconstructive surgeries were uh, helped to assist in, in that walking aspect and, and with my motor skills. So, for example, prior to any surgeries, I was born with my, my right leg kind of uh, lifted up because of tight hamstrings. Okay. And it was, and my right leg was also rotated outward, so I almost kind of dragged it along instead of utilizing it as a, as a, you know, to help me with my balance. Got it. Uh, so, so uh, luckily for me, these surgeries helped uh, loosen up those hamstrings, which brought my heel back down to the ground, and then they also derotated my hip wow. to assist, yeah, to assist with my walking. And these were surgeries done from ages seven all the way till about 18 or 19 years old, having uh, updates on these surgeries. Because as you grow, um, your posture changes and right. everything changes. So you have to keep up with that. Wow. Um, and the thing that the thing that might set me apart, and I, I feel as though I'm, I'm very lucky because, once again, there's so many different severities of cerebral palsy. I was able to be a little bit more mobile and also a little bit uh, to be able to communicate better and advocate for myself. And, and seeing so many other cases uh, while in the hospital, while in surgeries, seeing other individuals in similar shoes not 
be able to do those things, I felt like it was a gift and I needed to be an advocate, not just for myself, but for others. Oh, I love that about you. Uh, Do you identify, do you self-identify, like in cases where these days you have to fill out an application that says, are you a veteran, are you disabled, you know, are you male, female, black or white? Do you find yourself in situations where you have to self-identify as someone who was born with a condition other than traditional? Yeah, I, I love that you asked that question as well. Uh, you know, I would say in the past, I, I would probably be lying to you if it's not in the back of my head to be worried to identify at certain times. Right. Um, but as of right now, the way that um, the employment world is going and starting to realize it still needs to progress, and that's why I'm in this type of field. But um, identifying with a disability used to be, you know, scary to do because you were afraid of what you were going to be looked at exactly. or looked upon. You know, but I think it's actually more of a job security nowadays in some aspects, and I think it needs to be celebrated more because just because you have a disability does not mean you're not able to do things. It's it, it With reasonable accommodation, you could be just as successful or productive as any other individual. So to answer your question, no, I, I celebrate it. And I love that you celebrate it, but you also mentioned something that was really important to our viewers, that under the Americans with Disabilities Act, and other similar laws, you do have access to reasonable accommodations. Those are the actual words that are used. So I guess the question to you then is, do you need reasonable accommodations at this point based on your current physical attributes? Or is it something that you bypass because you you may not need anything different or special? So for for me personally? Yes. So for me personally, uh, no. When in, within the within the workforce, I would I would say no. Uh, in the past, I had I, I, I definitely utilized reasonable accommodations. Specifically, kind of going back to my childhood, I really struggled um, due to my disability with uh, grasping certain concepts and processes within school. I had learning disabilities, right. specifically within math. So a reasonable accommodation that could be uh, looked back upon was uh, extended time on my test. Right. I didn't get any extra help with my test. They just assist, they allowed me to take the tester at a longer period of time so that my mind could process it at the same rate or speed as any other individual. And I love so, that you say yeah. that. I do, because a lot of people just assume, since we have reasonable accommodations or sometimes we go to a different room, let's say, to take a test, or we get assistance, whether it's assisted technology or an individual who's taking our notes, I think the perception is that we have this, you know, we... I hate to say cheating, but it's like we have this advantage that doesn't use our own intellect, that someone else's intellect is also slipped in there, not just, you know, making up for the physical limitations, but also the intellectual limitations, where um, in my personal situation, it is about processing. It is about the understanding and getting some things in advance. So can you speak to how that uh, was was uh, um, leveraged, I guess, in your uh, school aged uh, experiences like, I guess, K through 12? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, d- definitely. So kind of going back to the whole processing uh, circumstances, I, for, for my example, when it came to math, I just utilized math because I, I took so many math classes over and over. Yeah. I probably, it's it's kind of comical. I, I, I said I went to school so long, I should have had a, like a doctorate degree next to my name <laughs> or a rocket scientist. But, but, um, you know, it was just kind of leveling the playing field. Uh, I could get the material. I can gain concepts. It was, I just couldn't get it as quickly. So a great example would be, let's say a teacher asked the question, uh, what's two times two? My mind would say, in a slow motion almost process, wow. what's two times two? And I'm still processing it, and people already had their hand raised. Right. And my hand was never raised. So they're like, oh, he must not know the answer. Right. And in, in my head, I'm like, I know the answer. I just didn't get it quick enough. Um, so it was things like that, to, to utilize that time to really just level the playing field and be considered uh, the same, in quotations, as everybody else. Got it. And so with all these surgeries and processing and placements as a young child, looking back, do you feel like outside of those things you had a very normal and healthy childhood? Yeah, and, and that's because of my family. Uh, I come from a very large family, uh, very well connected. Actually, just to give you a good visual, I was lucky enough to grow up on my great grandfather's farm, where the, the, the 
land kind of got divided to family members. So the entire street is all my relatives. Uh-huh. So on a holiday, I go left to right. I could walk back home. It, it, it's, I'm very lucky in that aspect. And I bring that up because um, they never looked at me as having a disability. Uh, they would put me in scenarios and not allow me to utilize that as a crutch or an excuse. Right, Granted, right. If I, if I needed to help, it would be there. But they didn't want me to just be comfortable with utilizing that as an example of why I couldn't attain a certain goal. And it seems like such a natural setting. So, you know, metropolitan living may cause, you know, you got to worry about sidewalks and all those fun things. But it sounds like you had an amazing childhood. Tell me what part of the country you were raised in. Yeah, I'm, I'm from Connecticut. I'm from New Haven County, just outside of New Haven. I, I, when pe- if people aren't familiar, I usually say Yale University. I'm right. about 20 minutes from Yale University okay. uh, in a small country town, and I'm still here. Wonderful. So how are your winters? Uh, you know what? Normally they're freezing. I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. They are not good at all. Um, but last, uh, last winter I was actually playing a uh, backyard football game on Christmas in shorts. So, uh, wow. Yeah. I don't, know, I don't know what's going on. I don't know if global warming, if you believe it or not, but it, it was very different. Uh, but I hear we're not going to be as lucky this year. Well, you know, I didn't want to get into the global warming, but that amazes me because I, I was expecting that you'd be, like, knee-deep in snow. But here, here we are, Rich. We're going to break for a commercial, and we okay. want to thank our sponsors, but I am so looking forward to getting back to who you are and what you do after the break. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in. I want to thank my sponsors, Connor Dental and Associates, for making it possible for myself and Rich to be before you today. Connor Dental Associates, full service dentistry, providing orthodontics, implants, laser dentistry, and general care, set in a calm and relaxing environment. Our experienced dentist and staff are here to maintain your dental health, improve your appearance and quality of life. Compassionate, professional, and informative. Ask about our core whitening system, servicing insured and non-insured patients of all ages. Located in Kennesaw, near I-75. Call today and experience the difference for yourself. Welcome back. My name is Yvette Pegues, and once again, thanks to our sponsors, and thanks to our listeners and watchers, and obviously our guest on the phone, Mr. Rich Luby, and his company is called Talk the Walk Disability and Inclusion Consulting. Is that correct? That is correct. It's for hiring and training for the disability community. So tell us a little bit about that before we go into more details and how to reach you, because I don't want that to get lost in all the great information that's coming next. No, absolutely. Uh, The the goal of Talk the Walk is to assist not only individuals, companies, but communities to be more inclusive. Um, One of the the main keys is within employment, there are so many either underutilized, underemployed, or unemployed individuals among the disability community. So my goal is to work with organizations, corporations, to identify qualified candidate pools for their open roles. Uh, For many years, it was... It was a good charitable thing to hire somebody with a disability. Right. It was a feel-good thing. And now more and more studies and more companies are starting to realize that it's not just a real good feel-good thing. It is, but it's a smart business move. It because is. You act, it actually not only um, is charitable, but it drives home your business drivers in so many different levels. Um, and where, where I come in is I want to work with a company to help uh, break down those, those employment stigmas, those barriers, and build an internal culture of acceptance for all and building hiring initiatives for companies. Uh, that starts with training and getting companies ready to, to, to promote and accept this change, and then finding qualified candidate pools within different regions of the country to uh, be onboarded as part of the workforce. I love that. I love that because there are organizations that do that as well, and we'll delve into that briefly. But before we move on to the next topic, tell us how we can reach you, Rich. Oh, absolutely. So it is Talk the Walk Disability Inclusion Consulting Service, and I have a website, ttwinfo.com. It's ttwinfo.com, and all my contact information is on there. I'm also on Facebook, uh, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Perfect, and we'll have that information on screen for you, as well as through some of the postings that we'll be doing post-production. But let's talk about something that you mentioned. So before the break, we talked about 
Little Rich and school, but how did you now transition as an adult with these abilities into someone advocating? I mean, I get that you get it, but I like the name Talk the Walk because we're all told to kind of be the world we want to see, and, you know, we don't take it as seriously as you have, so tell us how you made that transition. Well, absolutely. There's, uh, there's two answers I want to give here. Okay. Uh, the way I made the transition is, you know, once again, kind of going back, realizing that I wanted to be an advocate for the disability community. I found myself early on as an employment specialist, an employment specialist at an agency, working face-to-face with clients, uh, understanding their strengths and enhancing their weaknesses to help them find competitive employment. Um, I gravitated to that role, and, and one of the responsibilities in that role was uh, de- job developing, so okay. developing relationships with companies in that area to hire these individuals. Okay. I, I, I did it so well at that that the company at the time that I was with uh, promoted me in less than a year and then created a position called Business Outreach Specialist. That was where I represented the company, and as we went into new locations or had new programs, I would be the spokesperson for that company, kind of building those bridges, those relationships to understand the services that we provide. Um, I then, in my uh, last role, was the director of partnership development for an organization where uh, I assisted and helped them develop a consulting arm of their own company around the same realm, and then uh, would work with companies and develop hiring initiatives for agencies throughout the nation. And the, the way that I made the jump is I loved what I did, and I got great exposure and experience, but I realized that we weren't doing it in our own backyard. And, and at the time, that's, that's what kind of made me make the jump. That uh, I met so many great individuals, uh, other consultants saying that, you know, there, there's a need in this specific area, and so that's when I, I, I took the opportunity to do so. So I love that you do that. Are there other competing organizations or partner organizations that you work with? Uh, comp- yeah, you know what's funny is you would like to say in a nonprofit world or in the disability community, no, we, we're all together, and, and, and I would love that. But it, it's not like that. Yeah, there are competing agencies, um, and specifically because one of the driving forces behind these consulting services popping up is um, there are federal regulations now. Are you familiar with the 503 and 4212 regulations? I am. Yes, and so, so to your viewers and listeners, um, if you're a federally, federally contracted company with the government, and I believe it's as little as $10,000 a year from the government a, a year, you are now considered um, a federal contracted company, you have hiring benchmarks for right. your organization. And that 7% of your workforce has to be considered uh, disabled. And then another, it was a 9%, I believe it dropped down to 8%, is has to be considered veterans with service-related disabilities. Right. So now it's a compliance piece. And it's not this 15% within a specific role, like janitorial services, it's right. throughout your organization. It's from front line to executive level. And so these big companies, to keep these contracts and to stay compliant, are now striving for it. So it kind of opened up the floodgates and the opportunity to really say, hey, this is something that you have to do now. So I, I love that you said that because big business can sometimes see um, – all of the reasonable accommodations as a nuisance, as overhead, as money they have to now put into their organization. But what you're saying that by law, it's not just required, but there are rebates. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yes. And and here's the thing. And I say this because it's a good conversation starter. But when I go to businesses, I don't ever lead with the compliance piece because there are already so many compliance issues. Companies almost think of that as a turnoff. Yeah, we have to do it, but I don't want to be forced to do something. Right. The, what, what I'd like to discuss is that the, the business drivers behind it are so great. So with, within the disability community, you have higher retention rates for people with disabilities, which means lower ter- turnover, um, higher production rates at, at times with, within the disability community. Also, the buying power within the disability, disability community is around, I believe, $2 billion. It is. So, it's, it's smart for an organization to align themselves that we, we celebrate and accept individuals of all abilities because it helps not only save money when it comes to uh, lower onboarding, as I discussed, lower turnover saves money because you you're not onboarding. You're also selling to a whole other untapped customer base. Right. There are so many different aspects that a company could see, yet yeah, I'm actually not losing money here. I'm creating a whole other revenue market. So it's really corporate speak. I mean, you're bringing forth the positive, just like you said, with your own abilities. 
right? Rather than saying I'm a person with cerebral palsy and these are all my disabilities, you're, you're, it seems like you're approaching the corporate world in, in the same way. It is what it is, but let me bring to you the benefits and the great rewards that don't just come from a federal place, but individually and independently. And I, I really love that you do that because you're celebrating and welcoming and, and providing a privilege, if you will, in this new market that a few companies have not embraced. Now, what yeah. I'd like to speak with you about briefly is how do you feel about diversity of thought compared to physical and maybe positional disability? For example, uh, someone with a with a um, identified disability or a veteran status as opposed to diversity of thought based on where you lived and what you experienced uh, in that lifetime having to do with a disability instead of uh, aligning it with a person. And so if I understand the, the question, are you saying uh, how do I feel about, you know, kind of selling this approach to companies in terms of the physical disability between the, behind the hidden disability? Yes, and the diversity okay. of thought almost encompassing a group of people. So rather than presenting to them, yes. hey, I'm going to bring you a workforce with disabilities, rather come to them and say, imagine, if you will, diversity of thought. That includes someone who may have had a childhood or like yourself who may have had many surgeries and is now the person that he is today because of what was previously described as a disability. Yeah, see, I, I love that question as well because let's, let's be realistic here. Um, whether it's corporation or not, individuals who are not around a certain something or are not knowledgeable of a certain topic, they usually lead they usually run to fear, right. fear of the unknown. And so one of the goals with any initiative that I assist in is, and this is the reason why I call it Talk the Walk, is you want to you want to approach a client and showcase and talk about this issue or these barriers and, and have to educate people on um, the abilities behind somebody with a disability, whether it be hidden disability or not. And, and I'll kind of get to this. So, so many times... Hiring managers or companies will say, well, you know, I, I want to do this, but I'm a, I don't know how I would manage somebody with a right. disability. And, in, and internally I laugh because right. the, the reality is you are already managing somebody with a disability. Exactly. You may just not know it yet. Exactly. So, <laughs> so nothing, nothing changes. Uh, the goal is to educate them on, on let's see, anxiety, depression um, is considered a disability. Diabetes is actually considered a disability. That's right. Um, it, so it's just having people understand the definition of a disability, the abilities behind that disability once again, and talking through these things, talking through this approach, and educating the current work workforce and celebrating. That's why it's called Talk the Walk Before You Walk the Walk, understanding what can be done and how you do it. So a lot of times also, uh, initiatives live and die with the workforce already included. Right. And what I, mean, what I mean by that is, let's say all intentions are well and you want to do a hiring initiative, most of the time it will be unsuccessful if you don't prepare your staff and, and give them the resources to have this initiative excel. Um, so I always would love to go into a company to provide uh, resources for their ERG groups, right. um, just their employment staff in general, to get that culture closer to acceptance for all. So that way, an initiative not only succeeds in that that spot or that company's office but then it can spider out of course of course and it, and it just makes it's almost like a um, a ripple effect because it can only grow once they get past some of those initial barriers you're right it grows into something really beautiful and, and I love that you're doing that in Connecticut but when are you gonna expand come down to Atlanta and different parts of the country let's talk about that <laughs> absolutely well I appreciate the opportunity to you know to be on, on your show, and, and that's one of the goals. I, you know, I'm looking to travel. I'm looking to be a collaborative partner in this. My goal is to come into an organization and provide the resources and give hand them over a toolkit so that I could walk away and they could uh, self sustain this, these initiatives and these movements. Uh, I want to be there to help bridge the gap with local nonprofits where they can find these qualified candidates, these universities, and then I can step away and, and, and come in as needed. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it and hopefully I can have my next uh, phone call with you 
Or should I say not phone call, interview with you <laughs> face to face? I think that would be great. We definitely have to work on that off camera. And as I say off camera, I say it with a heavy heart because we're coming to the close of Disability Life TV in this particular episode. So what I'd like you to do, if you will, for me, Rich, is help me with something we do at the end of every show. It's called a D-Life Diamond. Are you familiar with that? No. Can you say it again? I'm sorry. It's a D-Life Diamond. I'd like for you to give us some kind of sparkle, some kind of jewel, if you will, to close out the show based on your particular experiences and what you'd like our viewers to leave with. Uh, absolutely. Uh, a little while back, I wrote um, a LinkedIn blog, and it was called The Definition of, Su of Success. Okay, um, And I think that this is going to be beneficial to people of, with a disability or not. Uh, many times, society defines success for us, okay? But the reality is success is personalized. And success for, uh, for certain goals might take a little while. But in, in at times, sadly, uh, some people set these goals that are unrealistic. So the thing I want to leave with everybody is, is this. You can attain anything you want, but you, want, you have to set reasonable, realistic, small benchmarks once you accomplish those, I want you to celebrate those benchmarks so that keeps you motivated to move forward to your ultimate goal. Got it. Got it. I love that. So basically, celebrating your abilities and preparing for diversity of workforce, diversity of thought, and the diversity of the world that we already live in. 100%. Well, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. I really look forward to a live interview with you and seeing you nearby because we need what you do, who you are, and how you support and serve the community of disability with a capital A. <laughs> so thank you for being on the show today, Rich. We will definitely be in touch, and I thank you all for watching. Thank you for the time.